Today, as you listen to this teaching by Pastors Ralph and Joanne Hone, we hope you'll enjoy it and learn some practical ways to walk into the awesome life God has for you. For more information and for more free teaching, visit our website, www.tapintothesource.com. Well, we're excited you guys are here, and uh, if you uh, have the Source Church app, you can follow along with notes on that. If not, you can download it later. Uh, I don't want you fiddling around, but you can follow um, our service along. And if you weren't here last week, I encourage you, go on our church app or our website and watch it. Go onto YouTube, watch it, because we started a series called Don't Fake It, Faith It. Okay, and so what we had talked about was in John 10, verse 10, it says, I came that they may have life and enjoy, have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Here, what he's saying is that God has planned a life for us that is so exceedingly abundant. Okay, just like that testimony said, a $61 million contract, you know, where it seemed like it was dead. He wants blessings overflowing in our lives. The problem is so many times we are living a a, a discounted version of ourselves. That's right. So we talked about that. We talked about um, the fact that we are settling for less. And we had a great illustration. And just because it's so fun, I brought it back. Okay. The women so, like this stuff, right? Okay. So we talked about fake, right? So we've, I've got two Prada purses here from our trip to Turkey. Let me hold this one for you. Okay. Thank you. Because it's yeah, make sure the Prada thing, because it's important that the Prada thing show up. But we talked about how the fact that there are fakes, and then there are, do you remember what the other is? It's a genuine, genuine fake. Do we have that picture? There we go. Yeah. I love genuine fake. It's kind of like, the genuine fake, what in the world are you talking about? Well, there is fake fake, which is cheap. Then there's genuine fake, which is not cheap, but it's cheaper than the actual thing, okay, because it's made with real things, etc., real, real materials. The problem is it's hard to start telling a genuine fake from the real thing, but until you get it appraised or the value and it's just not there. But the thing is, why do people live with a fake? Well, one, you may not know the difference. This one would be very hard to actually even tell the difference. So a lot of times we're living a, a fake life or a discount life, not even realizing there's a difference. Okay. The other reason is because we're not willing to pay the price of the real thing. You know, for this, I am not going to pay $2,400 for a purse. Maybe you can't. I'm, I'm, not, I just, I'm not willing to pay that, so I'll pay a couple hundred dollars for a genuine fake. But the thing is, in life, it's not enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put these here because they're, they're pretty. Get the women focused. They'll stay yeah. really focused. Okay. Girls focus, though. <laughs> focus, focus. Um, the thing is that with... With the discount version of our life, we often are not realizing that there's so much more. We're not willing to pay the price, so we, we, we kind of settle. And we want us to push past that because God has so much more for us. There are things, yes, we have to pay a, a price. Yes, there is more work. Yes, there are things we need to do that aren't always in our comfort zone to be able to get that genuine life. But it is worth it. It is so, so worth it. And so we want to... Um, Continue on today, because what is the difference that makes what is it that makes the difference between a fake and a real life? Right? Because you're kind of going a fake life. I don't know. Because a lot of times, I don't know. I've been there too. You come to church, you got the smile on the face. You know, you just had the lecture with the kids because you've been fighting all the way to the church, and it's that last minute as you pull into the parking lot, and you're like, kids, I'm going to kill you if you don't put smiles on your faces today and act like everything's good, right? You guys don't do that. We're the only ones. Okay, we had four boys. It's like, kids, please, please, please behave. Please make it look good. You know, but we put these smiles on. Everything's fine. Inside, we're just dying. Inside, there's just an emptiness. A fake life is empty. It does not have the fulfillment in it. It is temporary satisfaction, but there's no future to it. Hebrews 11:6 6 says this. It's impossible to please God apart from faith. And why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must believe that he exists and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. So we talked about this last week and we just kind of started on this. It is impossible to please God. Would you like to be a God pleaser? Yeah, I would. But the Bible says unless we use our faith, we can't even please him. 
So it's the faith that puts that seal of genuine pleasure on an item that makes it real. So today as we look at our lives, there's promises that God has made us in the Bible. How many people know that? Yeah. Go ahead, raise your hand if you know God's got some promises and if in not, the Bible we want for you. To you. Know. Yes. And do they come automatically? Why not? Why does it say, if you diligently obey the Lord, your God, and walk in his statues, then? How many people have read that? The if, then. The if, then. And see, we, we, when we walk through scripture, we think, well, God's promised it to me. It should be just automatically that. I mean, God knows where I live, doesn't he? Why doesn't he just go ahead and bless me because I'm just one of his favorites? He just loves me that much. You know, we, we don't even use that in the natural sphere because when you want a job, what do you do? Well, the employer knows where I live. Maybe. He knows my qualifications. No, what do you do? You have to fill out a resume. You have to then go and apply for a job position. And you have to get, do you have something to do with it? Any promise that God has in Scripture, you have a part to play in it too. Well, yeah, but what about salvation? Listen, unless you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, unless you ask him to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse your life and get your life on the right path, you can't walk with God. See, all of us want things easy. Come on, people. How many people want things easy? We just heard that testimony of the big $61 million contract. If you could get behind the scenes and get the real picture, come on, people. It wasn't that exciting. It was a lot of ups, a lot of downs, a lot of three feet, three steps forward, six steps back, four steps forward, two steps back. And, and we talked about this last week. Why? Because when you walk with God, there is an adversary, and his name is the devil, and he's trying to steal, kill, and destroy every dream, every vision, everything that God's given you. Every promise in the Bible is under attack if you're going after it. And if you push through, he'll push harder. He does not want you to taste victory. He wants you to stay in defeat. If you stay in defeat, he's got you beat. Well, that's just my lot in life. Well, if you only knew what the doctor's report was. Well, if you only knew what the financial, my financial situation is. And, and so what we do is we let, allow circumstances to be bigger than our God. Yeah. The thing is, there are over 3,000 promises in the Bible for you and me. And the promises are, you know, of God, it says, are yes and amen, which means yes and, and be it so. So if that's the case, every one of us should be living in the ultimate life all the time. We should have no need whatsoever. But obviously, that's not what's happening in this world. There is a way we have to access those promises, and that's through faith. You know, how many of you have ever had a prophetic word given you? Ever? Now, prophecy is when, you know, uh, um, a person hears a word from God and delivers it to you. I know sometimes we have guys who operate in the prophetic. Uh, we often do where we hear God speak a message for somebody. The thing is, we've had a lot of prophetic words over us. But you know what? Those prophetic words don't have to necessarily, or they won't necessarily automatically come to pass unless we mix it with faith. We have got to take the word that was spoken over it, whether it was a prophetic word over us, whether it was a promise in the Bible, if it was something that you heard in church and it was like, wow, God wants that for me. It's not enough for it to just be heard. Now we've got to mix it with faith so that it starts to happen. There's a lot of prophetic words that die and never come to fulfillment because we don't know how to take it. There's a lot of promises that die because we don't know how to take it and get it acting in our life. We have to mix it with faith. You know, I look at the children of Israel. Um, you know, if you know the story about the children of Israel, the, the Jewish people being taken out of Egypt, you know, and there's the movies about it and everything else. Moses led them out and they went through the desert for 40 years. Well, after about two years or a year and a half to two years in the desert, this is what God came to them and said, okay? Because he said, I have a promised land for you. It had been promised for hundreds of years. Okay, so how many of you know, sometimes we're tired of waiting a month, right? They've been waiting hundreds of years. Um, anyways, Exodus 33, verse 1 to 3. 
God said to Moses, now go, get on your way from here, you and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt. Head for the land I, which I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's the promised land, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel ahead of you, and I'll drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and the whatever elseites in a land flowing with milk and honey. Okay, so this land is amazing. It is amazing. This is what, it's like, it's as if someone in your family has told you about for five generations, this inheritance is coming. It's going to come. It's going to come. It's going to come. And now finally, it's like, hey, it's here. Okay, so the time has finally arrived. And what did he say? God said, I'm giving it to you. It's yours. And I'm going to send an angel to get rid of all the people that are in your way. How many of you know that sounds pretty good? Would you be pretty charged up going... Woohoo! This is the time, right? They should have been absolutely celebrating. So he said it was a done deal. Now what but, happen, What happens yeah. is Moses has sends in twelve spies to survey the land, and here's a report from Numbers thirteen thirty to thirty three. It says then Caleb quieted the the people before Moses and said, "Let us go up at once and take possession." See, they had just come out of the checking out serving the promised land. For we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone with them said, We are not able to go up against these people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in our men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sights. So what happened was, out of the 12, Joshua and Caleb said, hey, let's go. I mean, God already parted the Red Sea. Moses already hit a rock. Water came out of the rock. I mean, we've had one divine supernatural move of God after another supernatural move of God. Let's go and take what belongs to us. But 10 other guys said, oh, my goodness. This is like way over, way over our head. What God's asking us to do is, is, is something that we, there's no way we can accomplish. We will lose. We will be devoured. We will be destroyed. And what happened was as they spoke words of fear, doubt, and unbelief, fear hit the camp. You know, when you hear words of encouragement, you get around people that are encouraging, they'll build you up. You get around people that are negative, they're gonna, you're going to get their report and think the world's falling apart and everything. There's a lot of goofy stuff going on in the world. How many people know that? Just look around. Everything's fixed. No, it ain't. Yeah. But here's the thing. We serve a God that's bigger than those circumstances. And if God said we can do it, what do you think? You think we can because we can look at the circumstances just like these 10 spies did and say, oh, there's no way I'm ever going to get out of this situation. There's no way my family's ever going to get their feet back underneath them. There's no way my health will ever come back. There's no way, there's no way, there's no Why? Because you listen to the reports of qualified people, but they're negative reports. And they tell you everything you can't do. Come on, somebody. Yeah. But all of a sudden, you get the report of, Psst. you can do this. No problem. God's behind you. This is a God thing. This should be good. And you're thinking, when you look at the circumstance, it looks insurmountable. It might be just like those 10 spies. You're thinking, there's no way this is going to work out. Now you know you need faith. Okay, God, you promised it. I'm going to believe you. So because I believe you, now watch this. I'm going to do something. I'm going to take a, a step of what? Faith. Because I'm really not sure because I don't really yeah. know what I can see. I'm, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to step out and I'm going to say, okay, God, is this ground solid? I'm, I'm standing. Yeah. We don't like to do that. Why? Because it's uncomfortable. 
What are people going to think? Listen, what do, they care? what do you care anyways? They're talking about you anyways on Facebook and Twitter. Come on, people. Let's give them something to talk about. Let's, <laughs> let, let's, let's give them something. Hey, these people are crazy enough. They believe God, and we're going to step out. And what do you mean you're going to get a $61 million contract? Who do you think you are? You know where you grew up? Come on, somebody. You got to just push past all that and say, my God's bigger. He's got some bigger steps Absolutely. for me. I'm going to come on. And maybe you're even going to stretch a little bit as you're taking that step and you're going to pull out. Yeah. And watch what God starts to do when you and I step out. Mm-hmm. You know why God doesn't move? Because you won't take a... Yeah. Well, God knows where I live. He can just deliver it to me. No, yeah, that's not how it works. God says, walk with me. This is going to get good. God's trying to use you, that test, and change it into a testimony as you step. That's right. Are you seeing that? Yeah. See, but we will never walk in that just like the Israelites had bad reports. These spies looked at how big their problem was, but Joshua and Caleb says, we don't look at the problems. We look at our God. See, our God's a whole lot bigger than those problems. This is no big deal. If God can part the Red Sea and we can walk on dry ground, if God can do this, if God can do this, if God can do this, then this should be no problem. See, we are a church. The Bible says that we're to be more than overcomers. Everybody say that. I'm more than an overcomer. Let's say it again. I'm more than an overcomer. I'm more than an overcomer. See, we serve a big God that wants to use you and I to walk through situations that look impossible. Yeah. The thing with this is Joshua and Caleb believed what God said. That's what faith is, is believing what God said, despite a circumstance. And you know that because the 10 did not believe, they now had, God had to send them to the wilderness. They Wandered the desert for 40 years. That was never God's plan. God's plan was for for them to directly go into the promised land. So 12 spies, two believe God. Joshua and Caleb are the only ones that survived the desert experience and took the promise. The thing is here, another side, two did, the other 10 did not. But you know what? Hanging around the 10 that didn't believe also delayed their promise. Which is why sometimes we've got to get, you know, when we're believing God for something, especially when it's life-threatening, you got to get yourself around some people that really will believe, okay, really will believe to help push it through. But it's interesting because if you look at the beginning of Numbers chapter 13, it lists all the spies that went into, that were sent in. The only two you ever hear from again in the Bible that are worth talking about are Joshua and Caleb. The others you never hear again. The other 10 Missed out on their entire destiny because they let fear come in. You know, we cannot let fear of what it looks like in front of us overwhelm us. Faith is letting our promise of God outweigh the fear of the circumstance. It doesn't mean you don't tremble a little bit in your, in your shoes, you know, or kind of go, oh, are you serious, God? But it's, it's overcoming that fear with a confidence that God's promise is what God's promise is. And um, if we look at faith and belief, there's two things that we have to have. I want you to, um, well, first about Hebrews 4 verse 2. It says, for indeed, we have had the good news of salvation preached to us, just as the Israelites also, when the good news of the promised land came to them, like we were just talking about. But the message they heard did not benefit them because it was not united with faith in God by those who heard. So once again, they didn't take the promise that God, because God had told them he was going to do it. He told them, don't worry about it. I got it. Just go take it. And they still couldn't let it sink in. They still couldn't do it. But I want you to read this to you in a different version, Hebrews 4, verse 2 again. We have heard the good news, even as they did, but it did them no good because it was not mixed with faith. So here what it's saying is you've got to have the good news, the promise. Whatever God's got for you, whatever situation you have, find a promise that God says. If you don't know the Bible very well yet, um, we've got promise books in our gift bags for you. Uh, In there, grab a verse. Find out what God says about something. Talk to a leader. Find what does God say about my health? What does he say about my finance, about my relationship? Then you take that and you start mixing it with faith of actually believing that God could actually do what he said he could do. You know, well, first of all, do you know we have more faith in an airplane than we have sometimes in a promise from God, our creator. 
How many of you have ever gotten on an airplane? How many of you know how to fly an airplane? Okay, a lot less of you. But yet we still get on trusting that that plane is going to take us safely to where we go. Now, some of you might be shaken a little bit. I've sat beside people who literally put their fingernails into my arms because they're scared to fly. But we still get on that plane trusting. And we've got to start realizing, we've got to start trusting that God's word is a whole lot more faithful to us than an airplane. You know, with Hebrews uh, 4.2, it says that if we don't mix our faith with what we're believing God, the promise that God for us, it'll be of no value. It, one of the great analogies, and I was trying to get a... Um, um, a demonstration of this. All I have is a picture. I wanted you to see if you could put that uh, picture up of the uh, of the shuttle. Now, there's two fuels. Remember those back when they used to fly them? There's two fuels that they would put into there, uh, and they would have to mix them. And one was liquid nitrogen, and one was liquid oxygen. Now, outside of themselves, they really weren't a, 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 a deadly gas or liquid or whatever you want to call it, there was really nothing that would cause problems. But what happened when they would put the two together is what you see here. It becomes explosive. It becomes something that becomes energized. See, when we take our faith, we have a promise that God's given us, and maybe you're dealing with a health situation, and maybe the doctor's given you a bad report and said, you're going downhill, you're getting older, here's the facts, and they give you all the facts. Come on, people, work with me. Your hips are getting this, you're this, you're that, your eyesight, I mean, you hear about it. Everybody will tell you at certain ages, expect certain things to fail. But you know what? When you take the word of God, the promise that's there, and you mix your faith with that, you say, wait a minute here, but the word of God says that with long life, he will satisfy me and bring me salvation. The Bible says that I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Then all of a sudden we read that Jesus' body was broken, Isaiah chapter 53, so that ours doesn't have to be broken. We're starting to get some truth coming in. I can get all this truth, but unless I mix that with the faith that God says, see, what happens when I mix it with faith, the doctor gives me the bad report. I say, thank you for the facts. I want to tell you about my God, though, because my God said that I'm still under warranty. Come on, somebody. I might have to go back to the manufacturer for some replacement parts. But I'm going to now believe God that he's going to step into my situation, that God is going to, he's going to fulfill his promises. See, we think God, well, he might do it, he might not. God has no choice. He has to fulfill his promises. The Bible says that heaven and earth will pass away before his word changes. It's about as good as done as a done deal. See, when we get to heaven, God's going to say, why didn't you take that benefit I had for you? Remember we read that, Psalm 103 this morning? And bless the Lord and forget not all of his benefits. You know, being a child of God gives you benefits. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again to the other side. Did you know that being a child of God gives you some benefits? We need to be benefit collectors. Wait a minute here, but this situation is this. Yeah, but your company's had bad reports. Yeah, but I know my God. And if I just take my faith and I mix it with the promises that God said uh, that I'm going to walk in blessing, that God, I'm supposed to walk in health, I'm going to start believing in the good report that God's got for me. Because if you look at the world, you're going to get a bad report. I'm going to tell you right now. You've got to change your frequency on your phone, on your satellite dish. I would say, Dr. Tim, I would say, take your satellite dish and put it to the all things are possible network. That's God's network. Because when we're walking through things, you have to take and mix that. If you want explosive, powerful results, you've got to mix what you're believing with the promise that God has for you. Okay, so what exactly is faith? Because if if faith is so vitally important, we better know what it is. Hebrews 11, verse 1. We're going to look at it in a couple different versions, but um, in the NLT it says, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. So here it's saying basically that it's a done deal. Faith says that when you hear a promise from God, God says something to you, you just, it's like you can take it to the bank. You know, okay. God, God's got it. This is done. That's what the Israelites should have done. 
Because God showed up and said, I got it all taken care of. You know, now we look back at them and going, man, why didn't you just take the land? It's so easy for us to look back, right? (laughs) But how many things in our life do we need to realize? God is saying, come on, just take the land. Just take it. I got this. I got this. And we're letting fear come in. So faith is that confidence. I love that. But um, in, in the Greek word for faith in this context means to believe to the extent of complete trust and reliance. To believe in, to have confidence in, to have faith in, to trust. So complete trust and reliance. That's what this word means for faith. It means you can trust God. You don't have to try and come up with a plan B, okay? Because God's plan A will not fail if we mix our faith with it. If we just trust him, if we just count on him. You know, the one thing about this engine and, and, you know, the rockets and everything is that I think there's probably a little bit of pressure that happens to those gases (laughs) to have an explosion. And sometimes there's some pressure that comes but that doesn't mean that God's not working it out. It just means you're getting ready to absolutely explode into something new that he's got for you. Listen to what it says in the Amplified Version. It says, now faith is the assurance. In brackets, it says the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for, for divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by physical senses. So I want to give you an example. This is a photocopy of a title deed to a 2007 Cadillac Escalade, and it's black. And it has a serial number on it. And I own it. Let's say I took it, and I signed the bottom of the ownership, and I gifted it to you, and I handed you the paper. Would you now own a Cadillac Escalade? Where is it? Can you see it? What if I told you this? It's going to be at the box game. The keys are under the seat. I don't know which of the 20 parking lots it's in. But here, take the paper. Go find it. Would you go get it? It's a promise. Would you go get it? Would you seek, knock, and look for every which way you could until you get what you, what you were promised? See, that's what faith is. God promised it to you. He said, here's the title deed, but I don't know where it is yet. God says, take the title deed and start looking. Start expecting. Start thinking. Come on, God. I know it's, if it's not in this lot, I'm going to go to the next lot. If it's not in the next lot, I'm going to the... If I finish all 20 lots, am I going to still keep looking? Why? Because I'm holding the... Come on, people. Why as church can't we step up and say, that's my promise? I don't care what mm-hmm. everybody says. I don't, I don't care if I got to go to right. 50 lots. I'm going to take what belongs to me. <laughs> See, when you have a title deed, you say, absolutely, it's mine. Why wouldn't it be? I already have the confirmation that it's mine. I know I can't see it, but I know it's there. So God help me to see. Give me eyes to see. See, what happens now is the church comes alive because you start expecting. You talk to a woman that's that's pregnant. What is she? She is what? Expecting. Well, can she see the baby, right? Well, with ultrasound now we can. Back in the days you couldn't. But what's in her stomach? What's growing? It's a miracle that God's about to release in due season. And see, when we realize who we are and what God's given us, we'll take this title deed, we'll write it on our mirror, we'll write it and put it in our pocket, we'll put it on our phone, we'll do whatever. We'll say, I'm thanking God, look, God's going to do this and this. Well, yeah, but the doctor gave you a worse report. Yeah, but uh, you know what? They're practicing medicine. The last time I checked, Jesus has perfected it. This should get good. You just say, I'm not taking what the devil's delivering. I'm just not interested. I have a title deed of a promise that God made me. Yeah, but if you only knew what the real situation was. You have enough of those people in your life. Don't worry. You got to say, you know what? But with God, all things are still possible. That's right. There's one thing I want to do. As I want, if you have a coin in your pocket or your purse, I just want you to grab a coin quickly. Just grab it because I want you to put your hands on it and I want you to actually take a look with me. 
because obviously this is not legal tender because if you didn't know this, this is larger than a normal coin. And if you didn't know that, wow. Um, this is for <laughs> visual. Yeah. <laughs> but, and I hope I'm not blinding any of you. I did that once with a mirror. I actually was using it as an illustration and I was blinding everybody in the audience. So my apologies. But if you look at that, look at your coin and is it the same on both sides or is it different? It's different. So to be legal and to actually be able to use it, it has to have both sides right? A heads and a tails, so to speak. If it had two heads on it, would you be able to use it in a store? No. Two tails? No. Two of either one will not work. You have to have one of each to make it legal. The same thing happens with our faith. There's two aspects to faith, and one without the other will not work. Okay, there is faith and belief. And often we use them synonymously. We think one is the other, but yet there is a very subtle difference that makes all the difference in the world. To believe something means you believe something to be true, right? So the problem with is that Satan believes that God is God. He believes the Bible. Does that mean he has faith to receive the promises of God? No. Faith then is the acting out of the belief. Look, if you look at um, James 2, verse 26, it says, for just as the human body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works of obedience is also dead. Now let me look at the Greek word for works means action or active zeal in contrast to idleness. Useful activity in contrast to useless busyness. So here what it is, is you kind of go, you're just talking weird, okay? Belief and faith, it's all the same thing. Well, it's not, because faith is active. But you won't act on something if you don't first believe it, right? And so for an example, for instance, how many of you believe if you go to the gym every day for an hour, you are going to get into good shape? Okay. The rest of you don't believe it? Okay, you believe that that could happen, right? We believe it. But how many of you have the action of doing it? Some of you. I'm not one of them. Um, so the thing is, we can believe something, but yet not have faith for it. Because faith is believing something, and then, you know, I believe that working out is, I'm actually going to get into shape. Faith would say, I'm actually going to do something about it now. And I'm actually going to do something about it. There are so many things in our life where we want to believe, but yet we don't act on it. You know, we can believe in a great promise of God. God, I thank you that you're going to give me $5 million. Do you have a job? Well, no, 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 no. But God's going to give me $5 million. You know, you're, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. Have you gone to school? No, 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 no. I'm just believing that God says he's going to give me this and I'm just going to do it. No, faith says, okay, God, you've said that you've put this on my life. You've put this call on my life. You've put that in my heart. Now I'm going to take the steps to get there. Okay, when you have been sick, okay, and, and you've been diagnosed with something, first you got to believe that God is the one who says he will heal you. Then you start acting like you're healed. You start saying, oh, okay, I may have been given a cancer diagnosis, but praise God, I'm going to live. You start acting it out. You start getting that little bit more energy than you had last week. But the thing is, you're not going to act out something you don't actually believe. If you don't believe God's going to be your healer, all you're doing is giving empty words. Ooh, God's my healer, God's my healer. Oh, man, I just should be planning my funeral. I'm serious. We've talked to people. We've talked to people. Into our face at church, they're doing the praise God, God is good. Oh my goodness, yes, I'm claiming the promises of God. And you get them alone and they start planning their funeral. That is not belief. It is an empty faith that actually is not faith. It's just the words, it's the fake. The genuine is believing that what God said actually will happen and then acting like it's done. It's preparing. If you are believing for a spouse, guess what guys? Start expecting it. Start preparing yourself to be the best spouse ever, right? If you are believing God for um, a, a new job, 
Start preparing for it. If you were expecting a baby, you'd be preparing for it, getting a nursery ready. Start preparing. What is your life going to be like as you're getting a new job, as you're pushing forward into new things? We've got to start realizing that we have to have faith and belief to do these things. You know, Joshua, God told him this three times before he took Jericho. He said, be very strong and courageous. Be very strong and courageous when you're stepping out by faith. This is why most people don't walk by faith and it's so hard. Because they say this to you, I believe it when I see it. Faith won't work. Faith only works when you can't see it, but you walk in with your promise and you lock in and you say, okay, well, this is promised to me. I don't know how long it's going to take for me to find it, but I'll tell you what, it's my legal right to have it. I'm not leaving this earth until I have everything that God said I'm going to have. My mind's made up that my mind's made up that my mind, I'm just going to be strong and courageous. I don't know if this, well, this is, get real. Have you heard that one before? Let's really get real. Listen, the word of God is more real in the supernatural than it is in the natural. Let me say that again. Mm -hmm. The word of God is more real. When you get a promise from God, you ought to sink your teeth into it like a Rottweiler. You know why Rottweilers are so dangerous? Because when they sink their teeth into it, they don't let go. Yeah. I like what my son said to me the other day. He says, Dad, we need to get several more dogs for the yard. We have five acres. We need three more Rottweilers. He says, we need to call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I said, why is that? He says, because they won't bow down. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You want to be like a, 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 like a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego pit bull, that when you get the promise that God said is yours, you just sink your teeth into it. I ain't going anywhere. I don't care what happens. I'm going to fight. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be courageous because that obstacle will scream louder at you. When we started right. believing God for our kids to walk in divine health and healing, one of them especially, he had a deadly milk allergy. I mean, he went into anaphylactic shock with it. And we started speaking the word of God. We grabbed our title deed of healing and we said, you know what? This kid is not going to live his life like that. I mean, we had to read every ingredient that that kid, so we couldn't feed him anything because he would just, he got macaroni and cheese one time and one of those, he puts it in his mouth and he's in anaphylactic shock. It was off the charts. We could have said, oh, well, that's just how he's going to have to live. No, we grabbed the title deed from, from the word of God that said, by his stripes, he's already healed. We said, listen, I don't know how that got on his body, but it has no legal right to be on his body. So we're going to grab the promise. We're going to mix up our faith. We would lay hands on that child every day, every night. We would declare the word of God. Father, I thank you that this child is completely healthy and whole. Yeah, but the circumstances are this. Now watch this. A couple months later, we have him tested. He's worse. You could quit. We said, you know what? Mm -mm. No. God's promise is still real. Took the title lead and we just got more fervent. I don't care what happens. I don't care what reports are. We know our God is bigger than that situation. We kept pressing in. It's hard. I'd like to quit. I got tired. I don't want to do it anymore. Really, it's not happening. Your mind is throwing everything at you, but you got to lock in like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego pit bulls. Come on. And say, I'm pushing through. I don't care what happens. We test them again. It's even worse. You got to stay locked on that, you, you know what, my mind's made up, that my mind's made up, that God is still the healer. God can still do this. He's still big enough. I don't care what the devil throws because the devil will up the ante on you. I mean, they did increase the fire on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all the guys that were trying to throw them in died of heat. But watch, when they threw them into the fire, all of a sudden there was a fourth one there. And all of a sudden, they, when they stepped out, they didn't even smell like smoke. Yeah. So after 13 months of pushing and pushing and pushing with our title deed, all of a sudden we had him check. They had to check, check the tests and then check the tests again because something was wrong because there wasn't even a trace in his system of allergies anymore.
We need to be people that fight. From time of John the Baptist till now, the Bible says that the kingdom of God suffers violent, but the violent take it by force. Yeah. I'm, I don't care what my circumstances, I'm telling you what, I'm just going to push through. I'm going to just push through. I don't care what people say. I don't care how I feel. I'm going to keep pushing through. Yeah. See, when we get that tenaciousness behind us, the supernatural, God says, I finally found something that really believes me. Let's do this. This is going to be good. I want to invite everybody to close their eyes, bow your heads. If you're here in the Winnipeg campus as well, thank you for all the visitors there as well. But if you're here or online and you don't know Jesus, see, the first thing to walking in victory is having your life right with God. The Bible says that if you confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus himself will come into your life and change it. I want to invite you to make prayer, prayer with me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you and you're here and you're not walking with God or you did at one time but you've went away from him, just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need things right here today before we leave. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for that hand. I want you, everybody, to pray this out loud with me. Pray out loud online as well. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. Forgive me. Forgive me. I've tried doing things on my own. I've tried doing things on and my I've own. And I've failed. And I've failed. Jesus. Jesus. Would you be my Lord and Savior? Would you be my Lord and Savior? Change my life. Change my life. Make it fresh. Make it fresh. Make it new. Make it new. I want to live for you. I want to live Every for you. day of my life. Every day of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. For more free teaching and information about The Source, please go to www.tapintothesource.com.